Hey, what's up guys? This is Ricardo with RPT Creations. This is the video that I had promised a lot of you that I would make regarding putting in a K20 or K24 into a Mini Cooper. Um, the RPT Creations K-Swap Mini Kit um, covers 2002 to 2006 Mini Cooper models, R50, R52, and R53. Um, behind me is my personal 2004 Mini Cooper S. Um, the original motor and transmission is already removed from here. As a lot of you know, uh, the biggest issue with these Mini Coopers, as fun as they are to drive, the motors are terrible and don't last very long and they're very pricey to, to repair. So um, the factory motor and transmission is already removed from here. I won't be covering how to remove it in this video. However, there's plenty of tutorials and YouTube videos online that you can uh, research on how to do so. Um, I personally feel that these swaps are pretty simple to do. For a lot of you that have already done case swaps in Hondas or Acuras, will have a, a greater advantage on this as you pretty much already know the majority of the steps. I have here a uh, TSX 2.4 liter engine. Um, this to me, per, it's a personal preference. I prefer doing the K24 just due to the displacement and the torque. Uh, that these motors provide. Um, they're very affordable. If you search around, you can pick one up from a JDM Engine Depot for about $900. Um, there's very slight changes that you have to do to it um, to get them in here. There's uh, a lot of options as far as transmission goes, so you basically have to decide what's better for you and what your goal is. There's five speed transmissions, there's six speed transmissions. There's also ones with factory LSD or non-factory LSD. So really you have, kind of have to do your own little research and decide what setup is gonna be best for you. Um, but without further ado, I'm gonna show you the kit um, and explain what everything consists of. All right, so this is the RPT Creations full kit. Um, the only thing not shown here is the hardware for the motor mounts. However, each kit will include the hardware. Um, so starting off with the axles, you'll receive a set of uh, basic swap level axles. I have personally used these uh, with, since the beginning of my first K-Swap Mini Cooper. I have made well over 600 horsepower on these. However, I do not guarantee that they will last very long at that power. That is just what I have tested them to and they have seemed to hold up with no issues. Um, I have been working with Driveshaft Shop over the last few months testing uh, this new product. They will be uh, the level four axles for Mini Cooper to go with this kit. They are rated for 800 horsepower plus. And for the last few months, I have put them through some extreme abuse, making 700 wheel, and I have had zero issues with them. So anyone that will be drag racing or putting these through some severe uh, stress, I will highly recommend switching over. However, these will work to get you going. Uh, but moving on with the kit. The kit also will include a custom tucked K-Series engine harness. Each connector, as you can see, is labeled and you will know exactly what each connector is for and where it'll go. To go along with that, we have the uh, conversion harness. So the conversion harness comes with the C101 plug that will connect directly to the engine harness. It will also be integrated with a OBD2 port for diagnostics, and it'll have your three main essential relays. Also is an extended harness uh, in case you guys want to run a rear row two center. That will also be there. All right, moving along. Here you have your three piece mounts. They are polyurethane insert bushings. They are also powder coated in wrinkled black. Here you have your engine post mount, your rear engine mount, and your transmission mount. Also included will be this uh, spacer tube for your frame rail. I'll be showing you exactly where that goes and what it will be used for. This will be the complete kit that you will be receiving, and this is what you need to get the motor in the car. So this is what you should end up with once the uh, factory drivetrain is removed. Um, just a few things that I would like to point out. These first generation Mini Coopers, 
uh, they run the power steering off an electric steering uh, motor that is uh, fluid driven. Um, this will remain in the car. Um, this will this could be kept. I mean, if you prefer to delete it, that's totally up to you. However, the electric power steering does come in handy and it will operate. Um, and I will show you what lines, uh, what wires to tap into to uh, continue using it. Um, but first things first, um, this plastic uh, shroud that you see will have to be removed. Um, you can put it back afterwards if you decide to. The reason why we're gonna remove it is because behind here in the firewall, we'll have to remove the wiper motor to access the actual uh, firewall to make a uh, hole. That way you're able to feed the engine harness through to mount the computer inside. Um, it is optional and totally up to you. If you do not want to uh, cut into the firewall um, to feed the engine, you can mount, you know, you can find a, a, a place or a way to mount the ECU uh, tucked right behind there. Um, I mean, the factory computer on this car is mounted in the engine bay. So I will leave this up to you guys. Me personally, I always kept it inside of the car um, for a few reasons. However, you can pretty much do uh, whatever you'd like. So if you're keeping it in the engine compartment, you can skip this step. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and remove it. That way I can feed it inside. So on this step, I'll show you how to remove the uh, plastic firewall shroud. Um, so to begin, I'll start off with removing the two 10 millimeter nuts uh, to remove the power steering reservoir out of the way. Keep in mind, this does take a uh, special CHF 11 uh, fluid. It's very expensive. Um, this has a tendency of hanging down and falling over once you unbolt it. The cap is vented and has a hole, therefore the fluid will leak out. Um, so once you have this out of the way, you'll wanna remove the coolant reservoir uh, bracket. This is held on by uh, four 13 millimeter bolts, as well as two 10 millimeter uh, nuts underneath the uh, heat shield. Um, once that is removed, you'll get that out the way. You'll wanna remove both weather stripping and you'll have one plastic fastener here and another one on the opposite side. Then we'll move down here. You'll have one 13 millimeter bolt here. There will be another one be like right about here behind the heat shield that you'll see once you drop that. And then you have three more 13 millimeter bolts. There is one here, one there behind the AC switch and the last one there. You'll also wanna unbolt these two 10 millimeter bolts to disconnect and remove the AC lines. You'll have a clip here and you'll have a 10 millimeter fastener uh, holding the AC bracket there. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start to remove that now so we can continue on to the next step. So here we are without the shroud. Um, there's a lot more room. Um, so the way I've always done it was I've always made um, a hole right behind there, right next to uh, where the main harness feeds inside. Um, in order to do this, um, you'll have to uh, remove the uh, wiper motor um, and get it out of the way just enough for you to be able to uh, get behind there. Um, this is a bit tricky um, if you haven't done this before. Uh, so basically what you're gonna wanna do is you will have one 10 millimeter bolt here. You will have a 13 millimeter nut right there. And the very last bolt, which is a little hard to access, is going to be right up in there. That's also a 10 millimeter bolt. So you'll wanna remove those three things as well as removing the 13 millimeter nut here and the 13 millimeter nut behind this cover. Um, so you'll wanna remove both wiper arms, the two 10 millimeter bolts, as well as the 13 millimeter nut. 
And again, this is a bit tricky. It might take you a little bit, uh, but just take your time, have some patience, and you'll be able to uh, get it out of the way enough to uh, get to where we need to get to. All right, so the wiper motor, again, you don't have to remove it completely all the way. However, for demonstration purposes, just to make it a lot easier for me to explain, I'm going to go ahead and remove this uh, completely to get it out of the way so I can show you precisely um, where I tap into the firewall to uh, run the uh, wiring harness inside. Um, so let me go ahead and remove this and it'll give you guys a lot better view of exactly where this needs to go. Um, like I said, th these wiper motors are a pain to remove sometimes. It's very tight and it might take you a little bit on your first try if you've never done it before. But this is what we're gonna be working with. So right in this area here, um, by where the main uh, harness feeds into, right here in this area is uh, where I go ahead and get a, this is a one and three quarter of an inch uh, hole saw. All right, inch and three quarter. This is the hole saw that I use um, to gain access. And I go right about right about there. Um, don't mind the drawing. I know it's not perfectly round, but that'll give you an idea. Um, now, very crucial. Uh, one important thing is right behind uh, this firewall here, there's been a few chassis um, where it's came close and there are some um, that didn't come close at all. Um, you're gonna have to go inside the car, look up above the uh, steering column, find this um, main engine harness, look to the side of it. You might have to pull some padding. Um, look for a harness that runs across here. Um, a lot of the times when you drill into here, you wanna be careful because again, some have ran very close and you don't wanna cut into those wires. So if you go inside and you see that harness is very close in line, with this one, just grab it and move it out of the way. Use something to secure it out of the way if you have to, um, just so you don't cut into it um, when drilling this hole. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and drill this out and um, I will come right back. So I didn't think I had um, enough room in here to show you guys exactly what I was talking about. <clears throat> However, here is the harness that I was referring to. So if you get up under here, right there is the harness that I was referring to. So that's the factory harness that you just saw from the engine bay. And the one next to it that you see with all the colored uh, tangled wires, that's the harness that you wanna be careful that it's out of the way so you don't uh, cut into any of those wires when drilling. Um, a couple of the cars that I've seen, again, um, have this ran differently. This one is slightly close to where I marked. So if you see, I'll zoom in. It is being held by that clip there with a zip tie. I'm going to go ahead and uh, pop that out. And I'm going to secure it out of the way so I don't drill into those wires. Here's a good example of what I was talking about. All right, so the harness clips right into that factory stud. Um, just grab a mini pry bar or a flathead screwdriver, um, pry it out and move it out of the way. So as you can see, now it's free and clear of any wiring. Um, there's literally nothing else behind there to be cautious about. So I'm gonna go ahead and drill the hole saw. It will cut into the, the padding, um, but that's okay. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and go back into the engine bay and cut that out. There you have it. Uh, the hole is made. Um, once you drill through and get through the sheet metal, 
Um, like I said, you're safe. You can continue going a bit further. Uh, just apply a little bit more pressure inward and it'll cut right through um, the, the padding that it has on the inside. Um, now with this step, what I like to do, I mean, there's a couple options. You can either uh, find a rubber grommet that fits that size or um, this is what I like to use. I mean, I picked this up on Amazon a while ago. I forgot what it's called. Basically, it's a double-sided uh, molding of some sort. Um, it does have some type of metal reinforcement on the inside that allows you to shape this um, however you'd like. Um, it forms into any shape that you basically attach it to. Um, this is just a protection that way once you run the engine harness through over time with vibration and stuff It doesn't cut into the metal and then short something out um, So like I said either a rubber grommet or something like this uh, Will do or maybe you can get creative and come up with uh, your own method. However, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, cut this to length and apply it to my firewall Here's the finished product I have finished um, covering up the uh, exposed metal. Um, it is now protected. And once again, this is just to prevent the wiring from touching, uh, you know, coming in contact with the metal and shorten out from vibrations over time. Uh, the hole is also big enough um, for, you know, other stuff like I mentioned that you may have down the road, whether you want to run a wide band, uh, oil pressure gauge, um, boost controller solenoid wires, uh, you know, whatever you need to run inside the car, there's still plenty of room after you feed the engine harness through uh, to run any other additional accessories. The following step after here is basically just uh, reverse the steps, go ahead and install the wiper motor, go ahead and install the uh, plastic shroud if you choose to run it. Um, I personally am going to uh, leave the wiper motor out um, as well as I'm going to be deleting the uh, ABS system and I'm not going to be running uh, the shroud. Um, this is going to be a uh, pretty much strictly track car. So I am trying to eliminate as much weight as possible and just clean up the uh, bay um, as I go along. So I won't be covering those steps, but basically just reverse what you currently already did. And that's that. This will be jumping into the wiring just a little bit, uh, but I wanna cover it while I'm here. So from the factory, these cars already have the battery relocated in the trunk. And this red cable that you'll see here um, runs directly from the battery and it's what basically powers up uh, your starter and your alternator. This was clipped to the uh, plastic shroud that we just removed earlier. Once you unclip it, it's actually long enough and reaches here to the front. You can pretty much mount this wherever you want. Again, I'm just gonna show you the methods that I've been uh, using and it's worked for me. So you can pick these up on Amazon or your local auto parts uh, store. These are basically just like a, a main distribution block. It can be bolted and mounted anywhere and it won't come in contact or interfere uh, with the chassis. So. Right here um, on this frame rail post, there is actually a uh, welded or tacked uh, nut from the inside that you can use to uh, hook this up. So um, this will bolt directly uh, with one wire. It's more than enough. However, if you want that extra security, you can drill the secondary hole and run a bolt um, through it with a nut. Once you do that and it's secure, you'll remove the, uh, the nut, the crush washer, You'll go ahead, uh, put the cable through, put the crush washer back, and um, the nut. Now, once the engine is uh, actually in here, basically, you'll just want to run uh, terminals with a cable from this uh, distribution block, one to the alternator and one to the starter. And that is going to provide your constant 12 volts uh, to both accessories. So, again, I just wanted to cover it while I was here and just show you guys what I use. Here on the table is the factory engine wiring harness from my R53. Um, if you are using a base model R50 or R52 that does not have a supercharged um, engine, it might look slightly different. However, 
The main connector, this round connector that we're gonna be focusing on is the same on all three chassis. So um, this should be uh, pretty simple. Um, basically, just to give you an idea before I start, um, the wires that are here that we're gonna be using will be your starter signal wire, your 12 volt ignition wire to power up the ECU. You have your low pressure um, indicator light that goes to the cluster as well as the uh, wires to power up the electrical power steering is all fed into this connector that plugs into the uh, chassis harness that already is ran inside of the car. So this is the connector we're gonna be focusing on. I'm gonna go ahead and strip this harness down, remove all the loom and the boots. That way all the wires are exposed and we can follow them and trace them and you'll see exactly where they ran and I'll be explaining what they're used for. So let me go ahead and break this down and we'll continue. Once you strip the harness back, um, start at the round connector and just pick out all the wires that go to, uh, to this connector here. Um, and basically what you should end up with is these few wires right here. So I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna start with uh, this connector here. This is a two pin uh, gray connector. Basically what this is here is um, there's a little small cooling fan that's bolted to the electric power uh, steering pump. Um, if you leave it as is, it'll actually hit the block or the half shaft when you put the motor in. Um, so you have to eliminate it. Um, if you are handy and you want to fabricate some type of bracket to reposition it once the motor is in there, you can do so. Keep this. However, I haven't kept that fan on in any of the Mini Cooper case swaps that I've done and I haven't had a single overheating issue uh, with the pump. Then there's this black three pin connector. You have a purple with white tracer, a yellow wire, and a green with white. This is the one that you wanna leave intact. This actually will plug into the power steering pump itself. And this here is actually what powers it up. Um, so this connector, keep it if you're keeping the power steering. So I'm gonna set this aside. You'll also end up with this solid blue wire here that is attached to this lime green connector like so. Um, this, you can cut the connector off. This wire here is what will turn on your uh, low indicator light for your oil. So if you're ever low on oil, this is the oil light indicator uh, light on the dash. So we'll set this one aside as well. You'll have this heavier gauge black with yellow tracer wire with this terminal at the end. This is responsible for the uh, starter signal. So we'll put that aside. I'll show you where to tap these wires into later. Um, then you'll end up with these uh, buck connectors here on these wires that are tapped into the power steering uh, connector. Um, you'll follow them as far back into the harness as you can go and just snip them. Uh, basically, the black with yellow wire, um, you can actually get rid of this. That won't be uh, needed. The last one that you'll keep is this green with white uh, tracer wire. This here will be responsible for turning on the uh, ECU. So again, put that to the side. I'll show you where to tap that into. Then the last few wires you'll end up with here is this can this that goes all the way to the ECU. It is a blue with red wire and a black with red. Um, you can basically snip this close to this connector. This won't be needed. Um, if I'm not mistaken, these two wires are basically um, some type of purge valve for the emissions control that's in the rear of the car. Uh, so again, you can snip this. You won't be needing this. Um, everything else that I mentioned is basically all that you're gonna keep they run into the interior. So everything else you can pretty much eliminate. You're only gonna keep the ones that I mentioned, which is the starter signal, oil pressure light, the 
ECU turn on, um, as well as the power steering uh, connector. So these are the only things you're gonna end up with and then you can ditch the rest of the engine horns as it won't be needed. This is the uh, conversion harness for the swap. Um, there's actually only four wires out of this entire thing that's needed uh, to get it to run. Um, they're all labeled. You'll know exactly what each wire is for, but the important ones is basically your solid green wire. This is your 12 volt um, ignition wire source. Um, here, once again, we're gonna go back to the connector we just worked on. This green with white wire is basically going to go to this green wire. So this is what's responsible for turning, um, for powering up the uh, computer. You will have your 12 volt wire. This is constant 12 volts. Um, this will get an eyelid terminal and we're gonna hook it up into the uh, fuse box in the engine bay. Um, I'll show you in a little bit where that goes exactly. Then there's the solid blue wire. This is responsible for powering up the uh, fuel pump. Um, I will also show you where to tap this into. And then last but not least, um, in the C101 connector, there is this heavy gauge uh, black wire. This one is for your starter signal, which will go and attach to this heavy gauge black with yellow tracer wire. Um, this will, this is what's basically gonna crank over your motor once you turn that ignition. So with these four wires that I just went over, this is all that's responsible to get your uh, engine running. Um, then moving along, you will have this, um, or is it this purple or violet uh, wire that's part of the C101 as well. This one here is marked oil pressure. This will go and attach to the blue wire that we spoke about. Um, if, like I said, if you run out of oil or if it's low, this will illuminate the low indicator light on your dashboard um, in the mini. Moving on to the interior, I'm gonna show you guys where I mount the conversion harness. You don't have to mount it where I am. If you see it fits somewhere better, that's easy um, access for you. Go ahead and do that. However, I'm gonna show you where it's worked out the best for me. If you look underneath the steering column, you'll have this kick panel. If you pull down on it, I will typically mount them right there on that silver bar. So if you remove the three relays, you'll see in the back, there's the uh, slotted tabs. Um, and that's what I use to secure it. So I'll get about two or three self-tapping screws and I'll run them through and I'll basically mount the relay kit right about here. Um, it's out of the way, it's easy to get to, and this panel will still close, there's plenty of room. Um, once I do that, I'll go ahead and grab the few wires and run them through that hole that we made on the firewall. Um, basically, you'll wanna run this red wire, the green wire, the purple wire for the oil pressure, and this black wire for the starter signal. So grab at least those four wires, feed them through the hole on the firewall, and then move into the engine compartment, and we'll continue. So here's that round connector we were working on. There's the female end on the driver's side frame rail that it attaches to. The wire has not been extended. Um, they're long enough from the factory to wrap around the frame rail. I advise putting some uh, wire loom just to help clean it up um, and prevent it from rubbing up anywhere. However, on the end of it, you'll see the three pin black connector. That's what's gonna power up the uh, power steering pump. Um, and then those wires that you would have just ran through the firewall, this is basically where it's gonna connect to. So that heavy gauge black wire is gonna go, um, you'll solder it to this black with yellow wire cable. This is for your starter signal. The green wire from inside is gonna attach to the green and white wire. This will power up the relays and the ECU. 
The purple wire from inside the conversion harness is gonna attach to this blue one, which is for your uh, low oil pressure light. And then the last one that's left is the red wire, which the original fuse box on the shock tower, you'll pull the cover, you'll put an eyelid terminal, and I will remove this 10 millimeter bolt here and attach that red wire here. That is constant power um, directly from the fuse box. Um, once that's on there, just put the cap back and literally that's all it takes. If you're going to be running this car at the track and you don't have use of a heater core or if you live in a state where it's hot and you don't need the heat, um, the easiest way and the best method to get this in would be to run an external water pump uh, conversion kit. You know, you can look up companies like K-Tuned or T7 Designs. They actually make a kit that deletes the factory water pump, the factory water pump housing. It'll relocate the alternator to the bottom. If you do this method, um, it'll make this process a lot easier to install. Um, and reason being is the factory water pump on the K-Series is just so wide and bulky that it actually comes in contact and interferes with the frame rail uh, right about here. Um, there's a few ways you can go about this. Um, a few will cut this out if you're, you know, handy with body work um, or with a welder. You can cut that section out and you can, you know, get a piece of sheet metal and just round it inward and weld it back together. You can cut this out, flip it and weld it back. That way, this portion that sticks out will actually go inward. Um, the way I do it, the easiest way that doesn't involve um, any cutting or a welder, I'll go ahead and bolt the factory crash bar to keep the integrity of the uh, frame. I'll grab a hammer and I'll start uh, banging this frame rail in. Um, it's thin sheet metal. It doesn't take much for it to, uh, to go in. Um, just take your time. It might take you a few tries of getting the motor in and out before you get it right. However, um, it does work. You, you won't lose the integrity, like I said. And um, I've ran all my Mini Coopers this way and I've had no issues. Um, if you're gonna be running all the stock accessories in its stock location, like the idler pulley up here, the tensioner, the alternator, water pump, um, you'll have to do what I said, as well as you'll have to cut this section alongside of here for the alternator. The alternator pulley right here will actually sit right about here. So you do need to trim this out. Um, if you run all the stock accessories with the stock uh, alternator, but if you get an alternator relocation kit to where the AC compressor would go, you can pretty much skip this step of cutting this, uh, this piece out. Um, but either way, the frame rail will require some modification. That's about the most modification you'll make to the uh, chassis to get this motor to fit. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna do this process. Once I get the clearance, I'll actually show you exactly um, how much of it you either have to cut out or bang in, depending on how you wanna do it. Before we begin the process with hammering the frame rail, um, in the kit is included this uh, passenger side engine bracket um, or the post bracket. Included will, all, will also be this sleeve that you see here. Um, I just want to explain this step first. There's a little tip for you guys. Right here alongside the ground post, there's going to be a little uh, tack welded nut from the factory that looks exactly like this. Some might be covered with a plug. Some might be covered with a tape. Some are exposed. You'll want to remove it. If it's covered, you'll want to get a half inch drill bit and you'll want to drill straight through the frame rail all the way down. Um, then once you do that, you'll wanna grab this sleeve that's included. And this sleeve is actually, you'll reach your arm in here and you'll wanna insert this sleeve so that it's lined up with the hole so you can feed the bolt through. Um, the reason being is if you go to bolt down this bolt, you'll actually collapse the uh, frame rail. 
Um, the one further back already has a sleeve from the factory because that's where the original motor mount goes. So you'll basically just be imitating the one from the back with this sleeve here. All right, so that's just a little tip for you guys. So before you begin, just grab the bracket. It's gonna line up here like so. All right, you'll wanna feed your bolt through. You'll put the spacer inside the rail. You'll bolt it down and then you can start hammering. Reason being is if, if you don't bolt this in first and you start hammering in the frame rail, if you happen to go too far, again, you don't need to bang it too much, but if you go too far, you'll start overlapping uh, where the bolt's supposed to go. All right, so it's a little tip for you guys. Just install this first and then you can start hammering away. Here we are finished. So basically where this ground post is, is where you'll want to begin all right so you want to start hitting from here all the way till about where this latch ends all right so that whole section is the clearance that you need to get it to fit with the stock uh, water pump and then since I'm using this one as a mock-up that has all the factory accessories as I mentioned this is basically where you'll want to cut alongside to get the clearance that we need all right so those two things are pretty much all you have to modify on the whole chassis to get the uh, clearance that you need to put this motor in moving on to the second step of this install um, you'll want to go ahead and grab your transmission mount and you'll want to bolt it down completely to the transmission um, there's another tip you can keep these uh, factory studs here, if your transmission already has it, um, I actually recommend keeping the studs. This one here though, just make sure that you're using a shallow 17 millimeter bolt. Um, if, if you use anything bigger, this actually tucks right underneath the uh, frame rail once it's installed. So if you don't bolt down this uh, mount all the way now, you'll have a hard time getting uh, access to this bolt. So just be sure to go ahead and tighten down this transmission mount and then all the other brackets that are going to be installed you'll actually just want to leave them uh, fairly loose until the uh, complete motor is lined up with all the other mounts once all the mounts are lined up then you can go ahead and tighten everything down all right now we're ready to install the motor um, got the transmission mount bolted down to the transmission we have the passenger side post bracket bolted down to the frame. If you guys don't already have one of these uh, stands, I would highly recommend one. It just makes this process that much easier. Um, little tip for what's been working for me, I'll actually go ahead and start with the transmission and actually angle the swap with the transmission going in first. Once you get it, on an angle and the transmission is in past the subframe, I'll go ahead and swing the motor uh, the rest of the way. Um, you can try to put the engine in first and then swing the transmission. However, if, if you don't have the car at a proper height, the transmission starts to hit the subframe. The easiest way that I've found, again, is transmission angled in first and then swing the rest of the motor in. All right, motor is bolted in. One thing I did forget to mention, before you put in the swap, if you're gonna be running all the factory accessories in the factory location, the alternator does have to be removed before putting in the swap. Um, if you don't, you'll run into issues where the alternator will hit up against the uh, frame rail here. So once again, remove the alternator. My recommendation, because it's a super tight fit, as you can see, well, but all the pulleys are in and rotating. Um, grab the belt, put it around, you know, route it like you would uh, from the factory around the crank pulley, come up towards the uh, tensioner. Just leave the belt hanging right alongside of here between the tensioner and the idler pulley. Once the engine is in, you can go ahead and uh, put in the alternator, put the belt around it, and then bolt it in. Once it's bolted, then you can go ahead, release the tension from the tensioner and finish passing the uh, serpentine belt around the idler pulley. Um, that's the easiest way you're gonna get this on. Um, I know I keep repeating myself, but once again, 
if you get the relocation kit um, for the alternator to move it down by the where the AC compressor would go, you avoid all this uh, hassle and tight fitness. Um, this you're going to run into, again, if you're using all the factory accessories in their stock location. But to go ahead and continue, you'll, once the motor is lined up and in place, you'll want to go ahead and put the uh, post mount, leave the two Allen bolts, um, you know, finger tight, slide in the, uh, the Allen bolt through the post bracket. Once you got that, you'll come over to this side, you'll do the same, you'll grab the transmission bracket, um, and you'll leave these three bolts hand tight as well. Um, these three are going to, you're going to be reusing the Mini Cooper uh, transmission bracket bolts. These are a special thread and it's the same length that you're going to be uh, using here for my bracket. So once you get these three lined up, you'll go ahead and slide through the uh, Allen bolt through the transmission mount itself. Once you get that bolt in, then you can go ahead and tighten the three uh, transmission bolt brackets as well as the two um, post mount br uh, bolts all right the the main bolts though that go through the bushings for each side you'll still want to leave them uh, fairly loose um, once you get those two done we'll lift up the car we'll get the rear mount uh, put on once the rear mount is put on then you can go ahead and finish tightening everything that we left loose the bushings are just, you know, a very tight tolerance. And if you snug down the bolts, you're going to have a hard time getting the next mount on. So that's why I advise leaving them loose until they're all lined up. Once they're all lined up, again, we can come back and finish torquing them down. The rear motor mount is now installed. Um, this dog bone will actually go into place um, numerous ways but it will only line up with the bracket one way. Um, use this as a guide. It'll have somewhat of a downward um, angle. Um, however, once you find the, the right orientation, um, put the dog bone in first, slide this bolt through, leave it loose. Once that's in place, you can grab the bracket and slide it up in between the, uh, the bushing. Once that's through, you can go ahead and line up the four Allen bolts for the bracket to the oil pan. Um, you'll want to slide the main uh, bushing bolt through the uh, mount itself. Once you get these three pieces um, all lined up, you can go ahead and tighten down the bracket to the oil pan all the way. You can tighten down the uh, subframe bolt all the way. And then last but not least, you can go ahead and tighten the bushing bolt. Once this rear mount is all tightened, you can go ahead and go back up and tighten down the engine mount and the transmission mount that we left loose. So at this point, the entire swap and the mount are all bolted down and you can pretty much from here um, just start finishing everything off. Uh, install the axles, put in the transmission fluid, hook up the wiring harness, um, so on and so forth. 